Well, hi everyone. Welcome to American Peace of Presents Free Friday Webinars. I'm Shelly and this is Roscoe the Pug. And today we're going to take you on a field trip. <laughs> Every Friday you can um, join us. It's free. And the resources are free and you get a certificate of attendance. You just have to go to the bit.ly bit.ly ELT links and we're here every Friday because of American Tea Soul. So uh, we've been doing this for three years, about three years already. So we have tons and tons and hundreds of webinars. They're all free that you can watch and get a certificate for. Um, they're also on YouTube so it makes it pretty convenient and you can get the bookmarks as well. In fact, the slides are already up for this one. And today we're going to talk about field trips. We're going to talk about virtual and physical ones because I know a lot of people have been asking me, Shelly, I'm about to teach a summer camp or I'm about to have um, lessons in the summer and I'd like to take students into, into field trips or what do I do with them? And fortunately, I have run summer camps for language learners before. I ran a Spanish-speaking one, where it's Spanish and English. I've also run camps where it was uh, for health. We studied health, and we also studied English, and they were all-day camps as well. So the most important part of it, and I think the struggle with it, if you're teaching learners who don't want to be there, and I understand like a lot of times you'll have teenagers and they really don't want to be there. It's really important that we try to set it up as an adventure. We try to let them know, hey, this is not going to be your ordinary, boring English camp or learning camp. It's exciting. You get to be here. So it's not like, oh, my parents forced me here. No, you get to be here. And these are the cool things that we're going to do. We're going to go on some adventures and there are great, I love the way if you read, read Dr. Seuss's, um, oh the places we'll go, he, he presents traveling and being adventurous in such a great way. So I'm going to show you some good ideas for that but also some ideas because I actually did this for four years. I did this in a in a hands-on science museum and then I did this with the language institute um, for two additional years so I've done summer camps for six years and then I also used to do these with my church for several years so it's been probably about eight years that I've ran summer programs and the students always had a lot of fun because and, and I know some teachers unfortunately my sister she went into a program and even when she was teaching in the summer school, she made it to where the students had a lot of fun and she was with teenagers. And the teacher um, that was her mentor said, well, these kids are not, these teens aren't supposed to have fun. They're being punished. I don't think any student should be punished, so I'm against that. I don't care why they're there in the summer with you. You're going to have a miserable time if we punish them. Instead, let's all learn. Let's show that learning can be fun and then maybe when they get back to school, they'll be motivated to continue that learning and, and you'll really spark something in them. So that's always my goal uh, with students. Um, and it doesn't matter you know, where they are from all over the world. They come from different walks of life. And trust me, they want a summer vacation. They want something interesting to do. So these are all the places you can think of to do. So there's a lot of places you can go that don't cost any money. You can go, for example, to some museums. On certain days, the museums will be free. Now this was my experience when I was living in San Antonio, Texas. We have our free days on Tuesdays. But when I was living in Germany, we would have a free night of the museums as well. You can go to something like a factory. And in San Antonio, one of the places that we loved to take students and that I loved when I was going um, to school was the field trip to the Buttercrest factory because we learned about machines, you can learn about math, you can learn about the way they make things, you can see machines like pulleys and gears. See, you think about what they're learning and then tie it to something really interesting that's around them. 
And at the end of the butter crust factory, it smelled so good. But you would get a slice of bread with butter. So everybody absolutely loved it. It was the highlight for us. <laughs> You could go to a landmark. A lot of times you'll meet people around the world and you'll say, what are the greatest places to visit in your city? And they say, I've never been to the most famous landmark. So we can get our students to go visit these landmarks. I've been to so many landmarks in San Antonio. I absolutely love my city. When people ask me, and I've taken the students there. We've gone on riverboat trips and we've learned about the history. We've learned about the architecture. We've learned about the fair. So you can tie the learning into it for sure. Um, you can look at, if you're teaching math, you can look at the geometry, the shapes, things like that. There's different types of animal sites. So of course you have the zoo, but sometimes you'll have an animal shelter. Sometimes, like here, we have snake farm. <laughs> um, sometimes you can find where there's exotic animals. So look at different areas where students can see animals because they really enjoy um, seeing animals. There's many different businesses uh, that will also have these kind of gift packs. So if you call the businesses and you think of something that would relate, for example, here, Valero, They'll give the students, every time they come and visit, they have a package so students can, um, especially for young kids, they have like drawings, they have um, swag, we call them. Um, but they have a lot of freebies. So these are the places that you want to contact because they make it very interesting. They're used to having groups come in and they love that. It's good promotion for them. It's really good business. It's really good. It makes them look good in the community. You can have a lot of media stations will open up. So if you ask the local newspaper, if you ask, uh, we used to get the most famous meteorologist here, and he would always um, give us tours and everything to kids, and they loved it because they loved meeting a famous meteorologist. And then he would have them practice giving their own like weather report. So um, these were some interesting things that we did when we were there. City services. You'll be very surprised, but the, one of the most popular places that students actually enjoy was the landfills. And I know it's stinky, um, you know, you think it would be stinky and stuff, but they really enjoyed it because they always got these great packages. They always had really interesting um, activities for the students because the landfill, they really wanted to make um, a community a positive impact because, of course, that's controversial la landfills. So you can do things like that, and your students can see that. San Antonio Water System was amazing with our students. They would actually take us out in the river, and they would have our students, and of course the proper gear and everything would go with an actual um, um, engineer or scientist, and they would collect samples of the water, and then they would go under microscopes and look at the microbes, and they would identify the microbes. So there's so many different, we would have um, them go with paleontologists, and then we would go to a lo local excavation site, and we would look for fossils. So there are so many different things that you can do around your city. I know in Stuttgart, one of the most famous, um, when I was in Germany, factories we had that we take the kids to was the Porsche factory. So if there's something out there, a lot of times they'll let you do it for free. So... One of the most important things when you are on a field trip, and one of the things that happens a lot with teachers, is that the students aren't on task. And one of the reasons why is because we need to give them something to do. You always need to give them something to do. You can have presentations, but if they have presentations, make them brief, make them short, so see if the speaker will make them short. The worst thing I think in the world is actually, not the world, but <laughs> one of the bad things, well, I don't want to sound negative, but one of the things that I think a lot of us do wrong is we, and I've done it before, is take our students to a museum or take them to a gallery or take them to the zoo or something and get a guide. Do not get a guide. No, because your students are not going to pay attention. They're not going to be able to walk around unless you have a back channel. So unless they have like, um, you need to keep them to short presentations. Our students, very young, have about a five-minute attention span. So you're going to be constantly, um, and, and then it's going to kind of not give them opportunity to engage with 
instead try these activities. So I'm gonna um, one of if you can have them use their mobile devices or if they have digital cameras. So it doesn't have to be necessarily a mobile device, but if they have um, a a digital camera that would work as well, or even if they have regular cameras, just see if they can bring in a camera, okay? Um, it would be great if they can record video with it too. So these are the kind of lessons they can do with their mobile devices, and some of them they can do with just a camera. So for example, they can take a series of shots, and they can do a variety of things. They can create a brochure to advertise the what if it's the museum, the gallery, the zoo, whatever place it is you take them to, they can take a series of shots because they're going to work in pairs or they're going to work in small groups of three or four and they're going to make a brochure or they're going to make a flyer or they're going to make a digital poster or a commercial. Of course they can do this on regular, um, they don't need their, um, they can do this, they can print it out and they can make this with paper and regular poster board, that's fine. But what they can do is they can use free web tools, and I'm going to show you some awesome free web tools that you can use um, to do this. And I just remembered right now that I forgot one of the web tools I should have put on there, but I will definitely go and I will do it. Um, and that one is FlipSnack. So if you look at FlipSnack, I believe it's FlipSnack.com. Anyway, but FlipSnack, you can make a brochure, and it's very, very, very nice brochure. So um, that's an option there. Um, another option is TAC.com. It's one of the easiest ways. It works on all devices. So if they have a laptop, if they have a Chromebook, if you have a mobile device, Android, iOS, iPad, it works. It's TAC.com. They only have to go to TAC.com. It actually doesn't have an app, but it works if you just put TAC.com. It's real simple, and they can create multimedia flyers and posters. Another very popular one with teachers is S'more.com. And in the bookmarks, I have actually bookmarks. Uh, where they went to an art gallery and each of the students made a s'more with a different artist. So they can add videos, they can add pictures, and s'more actually has creative common or pictures in their library that you can use. So this is one thing. And you know, if you let the, the gallery or wherever you went know, hey, we made all of these digital posters for you, the gallery will be so excited, and the museum will be so excited, and they might even feature it on their website. So definitely let your students create these, and then talk with the museum or the gallery and let them know what you're doing. Because what's more powerful, and what's really amazing, is if the students see that the gallery puts it up, the digital posters, um, then they will love that, that your students will be very excited. Another thing you can do, of course you can, in the last, one of the last presentations we recently did was end of these school year activities. Um, so one of the ideas is make a magazine or a newspaper, so you can have them each do that. Maybe you go visit the zoo and you report, each group is responsible for reporting on a different animal um, and what happened and what occurred. Or maybe it's an art magazine, or maybe it's a gallery magazine, or maybe wherever they go, they can create a topic on that. But they can also do things where they can make scrapbooks. Um, they can make, I recently found out that Pig Collage, which is one of the best apps out there and it's free. By the way, I only share free things because I love free things and teachers I know are on a budget. So all of these are free. The new thing I learned with Pig Collage, you can add pictures and all of these things is really pretty and really nice. But now you can add video. So Pig Collage, is an amazing way to make a flyer or to make a, you can even do a template to make a scrapbook. And so it, it's really nice because now you can add video. I always share, and so you'll see this time and time again because I love this tool so much, which is um, really, Catherine, you will love it. So yes, you have to try it and students love it. They absolutely love Pick Collage. <laughs> um, the other one that you'll probably like a lot is Bunty. Bunty is one of my favorite tools. I share it often because they just get more awesome each time. You make a multimedia poster. Now, a lot of teachers like Glockster. I don't like Glockster. There's a couple of reasons why. One, because Glockster always messes up. You need too much bandwidth. And the places that I'm at, it always messes up. So I do not like, um, I do not like it at all. I don't like Glockster. 
and there's very questionable stuff on Gawkster. You can run into a lot of bad things the kids can. So I prefer instead, I prefer Buncee.com. And Gawkster EDU, you have to pay for. So that's why, well, at least last time I remembered you did. So, but that is an option. I prefer Buncee. Buncee has stickers. It has audio you can add. Um, you don't have to go outside of Buncee. You do this all within the canvas. So your students are there and they're creating. It, it, it's wonderful. I love it. I absolutely love it. You can have um, background stickers, quotes, and make it look very, very nice. But the other thing I really love about Buncee is they have a free iOS app. So you can go and add links and all, and you can make a really beautiful, you can even draw, which I absolutely love. So when your students take pictures, they can use the Buncee app and they can draw on it and they can make comments and um, they can they can make a flyer, things like that. So it's really, really a nice option. Byteslide.com is another really good option. They're educationally safe. I've seen a lot of things. They have digital scrapbook templates. They have where you can make multimedia. So I prefer these than um, Glockster. But I know a lot of teachers out there love their Glockster. <laughs> You can have, okay, this is one of my favorite ideas. Um, you can have your students, if you get a map, and usually if you go to the front, you'll always have like a brochure of wherever you go. Either the museum, over here, if you go visit. Um, and that's another great place if you have an Air Force base or you have um, a base or anything like that, a monument, something like that. It comes with a map. So if you put that map on ThingLink. See if you can use a map for ThingLink. You know, you might even have to draw your own, but see if they have. And then make it interactive. Make each pair or each student responsible for one of the hotspots on ThingLink. So they can either put something like a video, they can put a game, they can put, um, they can put text, they can put a link. So they make this an interactive map. They go through each of the galleries. They have to take pictures. They have to make a requirement so that way they interact with that particular one. So you make them responsible for that area and they take pictures, they write stuff about it, um, they make a video, and then they can go to the hot spots. You can make this where it's a collaborative. They go to the hot spots and then they add their hot spot on their area and then they go and they make a wonderful interactive map of where they just visited. So um, that's a good, that's another idea for wherever you visit. And if you show that, once again, to the place, like if you showed it, for example, to the zoo or anything like that, they would love you for that. They would say, wow, this is so amazing. Thank you that your students did this for us. You can have, or you can have it where it's like podcast, where they just click. And, and you know the great thing about it is once you put it on theme link, then that means the whole, everybody else, so people can go and that can be a resource. They can use the students' um, reviews or or their highlights of each exhibit, they can listen to it they, just by accessing on the internet. So it's a it's a way to really help the community as well. Animoto.com, so you can tell students, we're going to make not a brochure or a poster, but we're going to make a commercial. We're going to make a commercial for this museum, or we're going to make a commercial for uh, the zoo. And, and then you can have them work in um, either pairs, or they can do this on their own. One of my favorites is uh, Animoto.com because they can do this online, they can do this for Android, they can do this for iOS, There's, so they can make a really nice commercial uh, for wherever they visit. They can collect data, so you can have them collect certain types of data. Uh, for example, um, if they're going to visit the zoo, how many animals are in that area? Like uh, what type of animals? Do they hibernate? They can collect all kinds of information, and then they can create an infographic. One of my favorite tools to do that with is pictochart.com. I really like pictochart.com. S'mores is saying that they're going to come out with an infographic type of tool as well. Um, but you can, they can use something like that, and they can put this in beautiful statistics. They have nice templates. They can put the pictures up, and it looks really nice. Another idea when they go on field trips, is have them scan the QR codes um, and choose three to present. Wow, why didn't my pictures come out? I don't know why my pictures didn't count. Okay, so they can choose three to provide hints for a peer to find. So what you can do is they can go, see, here we go. Um, so they, a lot of times when you go to 
you you go to a museum now or a library, they have QR codes. Once you download a QR code, you don't need the internet to use it. I mean, um, to scan certain text. Now, if it's a link or if it goes online, then yes, you do need that. Um, but what the thing about it is that when I go to the art galleries and everything, the QR codes are are very boring. They just have a bunch of text or something sometimes. Or it's not very interesting. So, you, so what you do is you tell your students, um, okay, each of you is responsible for scanning a couple of QR codes. You can give them a certain number. And you have to make it a more engaging QR code, the content. So for example, if it's just text, then they can make a podcast. They can make a video where they describe certain things. They can make, for example, um, a video tutorial. They can create a game. Like maybe they scan it and it goes to a, a photo piece slide share, or maybe it goes to um, maybe it goes to their digital poster. So they have to make it more engaging. Maybe it goes to podcasts where they're just talking and they're saying things about the. Maybe it says a story. So there's so many different things they can do with that. They can even do this with something called Erasmus. So what they can do is they can make it also augmented reality if they use something like um, like Erasmus. Um, and that's free as well. The other idea I had was for them to actually, you can make a game, another, a game where they scan two or three QR codes. And what they do is they get the information and then they write three hints. Okay, so what they're doing in this game is they take three, they write three hints about it, and then they give those hints to a peer, and you can assign that ahead of time. And what the peer has to try and find that exhibit. They have to go scan with their QR code um, and try to find what that information. Or they can match questions. They can write three questions, and then the peer can walk around the exhibit. So you can say, okay, you've got five minutes or 10 minutes, have them walk in, they scan the QR code, three, they write down the questions, they come back, and then they switch with the peer, and then they have to go find each other's questions, they either have to answer the questions, or they have to find what the exhibit is. So that's the kind of game that they can play, and it gets them interactive and really engaging with the information. Another thing they can do is they can do something like um, with great apps. Um, they could, for example, they can introduce an exhibit or an area with telegami. And the reason why is because telegami allows you to upload your own pictures. Now, before uploading pictures, you have to make sure with the museum or with um, the zoo and all of that, you have to get permission first to make sure that they can take pictures because certain galleries and stuff will not allow pictures. So that is very important when you go. But if they're allowed to take pictures, then they can upload that to the back, and each of them is responsible for that exhibit. So for example, they can have a picture of maybe the, they can do this with the giraffe, and then they can come up as an or as a telegami avatar. Um, and I've seen six-year-olds use this in Indonesia, so it's pretty simple to use. And then they describe it. They say, at the zoo, you'll see the giraffes, and the giraffes are, this feet tall and their names are, or whatever information that they gather with, that they gather from it. Um, they can also take pictures of the animals, so if they go to an animal, and they can make them speak. They, and, and they can say information about that animal, what they learned about the animal. They can take a picture of a panda playing. Um, and it's important that they take pictures of what they're experiencing now, what they're seeing now, like an aquarium or something like that. And then they do, they can make little, they can make it say, oh, well, I'm an herbivore and I'm originally from Africa or, <laughs> so this is exactly, this is Roscoe, um, the peg here. He has, has kindly provided you his own yakit example. <laughs> Wikitude is, uh, it may be for older learners, but it has a lot of history. It's sort of like augmented reality and it tells you the history. But it usually works in big cities, so it, it gives you like a history of the great, um, different types of great things there. Another thing to point out is a lot of museums now have their own app. So you can search for wherever field trip you're going, wherever the place is, the capital, anything like that. 
search it and see if it has a free app with cool things. You can create a scavenger hunt. Now you can do this with a worksheet. I've done that plenty of times. But the other thing you can do is you can use the free scavenger hunt app. A lot of teachers are doing this. And they're associating points with, um, with finding out information from different types of areas inside of the field trip. Um, the other app that is really fantastic that I found that I love, and you might just use it for yourself because I do, is fieldtripper.com. Fieldtripper.com, it works for Google Play and the App Store, so it's multiple devices, which I love. It's free. But what it does is when you scan around you, it tells you the history of everything around you. It tells you important facts. Um, Alexandra, Flipper, uh, Field Tripper actually works with. Android I, as well. <laughs> so you don't need an alternative. <laughs> so you get all this information and it shows that everywhere learning is around you. You get some interesting facts. So they can go outside and they can, you can take them to the center square and when you take them to the center square they can look and see what kind of interesting facts they find, come together and then share them. They can do like an exchange it and stuff. Oh, unfortunately there isn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, they can go on a virtual field trip, okay? And the virtual field trip, like Peggy mentioned earlier, is sometimes a lot cheaper. So if you're on a budget and you can't afford the transportation to go somewhere, then go on a virtual field trip. Last time we talked about a few of these things. One of the favorite places that I like is if you go to Google.com Cultural Institute, You'll see where you can visit art galleries. You can see where you can visit times in the past history. And then you can see where you can visit places all around the world. They have a curriculum and lesson plans for free already outlined for teachers. So you don't even have to come up with lessons for it. They already have them. Google Earth, a lot of teachers have made Google Earth. Um, and, and you see it in real time. Like it, It's sort of like Google Maps. When you go and it's like that 3D and you're like right there, it's very cool. And you can do the same kind of activities, like a scavenger hunt, where they can look for certain things um, that you want them to pay attention to. Google Lit Trips, that's associated with any type of book or anything you're reading. It'll actually let you go to the places and study those places. So that's a really interesting, great resource as well. Um, and one of the things I think is great for is most of your museums will have a virtual museum. So you can visit, for example, um, you can visit MoMA, the, <laughs> you can visit really the Smithsonian, I mean really famous ones. You can visit the ones in Italy. I mean there's so many places you can visit um, that have the Vatican and all that, that have like a virtual part online. Some of them even have a 3D walkthrough like um, the Eiffel Tower does. So you can go and you can actually look in real time and it's, it's all 3D around you and it's free. So these are different types of uh, places that you can vir visit virtually. There's so many places you can visit virtually. You can visit, um, and don't limit it. You, if you're a seaport, if you you can visit pirate ships. You can visit ships. You can visit famous, like, Navy uh, ships and things like that. So there's so many different places that you can go. Yes, exactly. They even have, like, virtual trips to underwater, I think, like, um, excavating these old sunken ships. So. They're ghost towns, they have, you know, trips where you can go online and you can research where there are ghosts historically. You can listen. So there's so many different things you can do. A few tips that I have learned. This is what my summer camp schedule looked like. Make a schedule. You can do it with Google Calendar. Um, make it online for your parents, um, for the students. And that way they know what's coming up and they can prepare. So let them know ahead of time. We're going to go, for example, we did tie-dye and swimming. So they needed to make sure that since we were working with tie-dye, that they weren't going to wear the most expensive outfits. So you, you, we need to make sure things like that. You may want to get them aprons um, so they don't ruin their clothes. Because I know parents, they sometimes let their children come. They think it's the summer. They can wear their sneakers. They're so glad to be out of a uniform. But then you're like, hey, you're going to really um, hurt your, you're going to destroy your new clothes. So. And make sure that they're well dressed, they're well prepared, they come with everything they need to come with um, when they're going on that particular trip. It's also really important we get parent permission. Um, it's important that in our parent permission when we're having them, 
we ask them about things like allergy, medication, anything like that, because during a trip, there's so many things that um, you have to worry about. Like, and some students have psoriasis or they have other really sensitive skin and they may not be able to go in the sun for too long or they may need to put sunscreen or sunblock. So it's important that we have the communication with parents so we can avoid disasters. I've had so many times where I've had to carry kids and, you know, they've been hurt and, you know, I've learned the hard way, you know, about kids getting hurt and stuff. So, um, and nothing serious happens, so that's very good. But, you know, little scratches and stuff, and we want to avoid that. So make sure you get parent permission. And um, you can always invite parents to chaperone or suggest places as well. The other thing, and I forgot to put it on here, is when you're on a field trip, it's very um, smart to have an umbrella. When you're walking around, sometimes you'll see people with a bright umbrella. Um, that way, if anybody gets lost, they know where to find you in your bright yellow or orange or green cool umbrella. Um, it's also a good idea to have all your students wear the same shirt, so that way they know not to get lost. Or if, for example, a student gets lost, then the security guard knows, oh, this is where they belong. And it's good in the back of their shirt if you put um, if, if you put the school name or um, and a contact number as well. A lot of times what we do, the reason, going back to the calendar, um, that we have this kind of tie-dye making shirts is because these are the shirts that we're going to make and wear on all our field trips. So we take care of that ahead of time. We have the number in the back, we have the name of the school, we have the name of the teacher or the contact, um, and then we also have, you know, the whatever the symbol or whatever we are about the shirt. So we make that ahead of time, and then we go to the field trip. And the other thing that we need to do is make, safety is key. So always bring a first aid kit. In Germany, you actually had to get certified. So I had to get my certification for um, CPR and and all kind how to um, how to how to do things like a, a gurney and. When I was running the camps in Germany, um, it was really important that we we knew how to do all of this. We had to have that certification, or else we couldn't do the summer camp. So, it's a, when you're working with your first aid kit, if you can do um, a lesson, if the school will pay for you to to get that training, it's really important, or somebody get that training. Um, um, it's good that it, you carry the different, make sure that you, you carry a lot of things on the safety trip appropriate to the trip. So for example, cortisone, if you're going outside, or sunblock, then you may need to add that um, during certain parts of the trip where it's sunny. Make sure that the kids know, wear hats. Um, you know, we want them to protect themselves. So we need to make think about all of the hazards and everything that could happen, and then we prepare the kids. We say, look, this is a checklist of what the parents can go. Um, one of the field trips you can take them on, teach them first aid so that way they can take care of themselves. It's a great way to make it engaging so that way they know ahead of time and they can take care of each other. You can get an expert, an expert will come and usually they have a discount or something with the whole class or school. Um, a lot of times you can just, if for a summer count, you can add that in the price and that way the parents know that their students um, their children actually got certified in first aid and they get a little certificate. The kids really like it. Um, and it could save a life someday. When they get CPR or the choking one, um, it, it could save their life someday. So it, it's always nice, you know? <laughs> and it's usually good for about a year or two or three. You can find all of this information at PaulTrees.com. And if you go to Shelly Terrell, then you can just find all kinds of good stuff. Why do I love field trips? Well, whether it's virtual or whether you're going to a place, um, the great thing about field trips, and you can take them every day in the summer at your summer camp and learn while you're there, but the great thing about them is if you keep them on task, if they're always doing something, then they're always learning. It's an interactive way to learn, but it's really that time when you get them to go around their surroundings and they say, wow, there's this cool thing in my city, there's this cool thing here, and it's learning all around them. All of a sudden, you've opened their perspective, and they'll never see their city or their surroundings or their place the same way again. Instead, they'll have bright eyes, and they'll be like, wow, this is amazing. 
I hope this helps motivate your students in the summer and you go on lots and lots of cool adventures. And thank you, Peggy, for sharing all the links. And you can always go to um, ShellyTarrell.com for the webinars as well, and you'll see everything there. If you have any questions, you can always go with go contact me at any of these places. And uh, usually on Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus, I'm pretty good about responding fast. So thank you so much, and glad you enjoyed it.